So let's focus on thymus. So thymus is one of the organs that is responsible for tolerance. Meaning what? Tolerance is the procedure by which the human body is able uh, to prevent any activation, any destruction against its own self. For example, uh, we have in some pathological cases, we have diseases such as autoimmune diseases in which uh, a specific protein or enzyme or uh, saccharide is uh, of the human body, of our own self, activates the, the adaptive system and induces a whole destruction, inflammation and inflammatory markings and uh, results into the destruction of this specific organ, cell or tissue. <clears throat> so the thymus is responsible for the central tolerance. This is, uh, of course, the location where we produce naive T lymphoblasts. Now, in this case, these cells are uh, what the term naive means that it's fully developed and fully matured but not yet activated. So uh, central tolerance actually in the thymus is achieved by selecting exactly very, in a very very accurate method which of the, uh, T, the T precursor T cells that come inside the thymus come to the thymus are actually the ones that are able to function properly in the human body. We'll see the process of how this happens through positive and negative selection. So uh, then we, the, the, we, also, we also know that the thymus is an organ that changes sizes, it means, meaning that uh, throughout their whole uh, infant life and uh, like in very, very young ages, the thymus is quite large. And as time progresses, it undergoes involution. Of course, this means shrinking in size. And many parts of the thymus are actually substituted by adipose tissue. It is really important to notice that the only uh, white blood cell present in the uh, thymus is only the T cells, not B cells, not even one. We'll find other, of course, uh, populations of uh, cells inside the thymus, but when it comes to white blood cells, only the T are present. Specifically, we will find this unique cell, uh, this thymic epithelial cells. Now, these cells are the reticular, may consist the reticular element of the thymus. I already discussed in the beginning of the video that, of course, all the lymphoid systems require this, this reticular system because of the high need for proper cellular interaction. So these cells, again, there are three, type, three subcategories of the thymic epithelial cells, also called reticular epithelial cells, depending on uh, the text that you use. And we'll see the first example of the thymic epithelial cell in the blood thymus barrier, and we'll discuss them throughout the whole process. So let's just check shortly the structure of thymus and let's proceed on to the rest of the video. So in the outer part we have that capsule. Capsule is always consists, consists of uh, dense irregular connective tissue. Exactly beneath we're going to find the reticulum of epithelial cells. This is the thymic epithelial cells. Now in this case, this exactly this location, these cells uh, serve the function of the thymus blood barrier. What does this mean? We'll discuss actually the structure in short in just a bit. There's a whole specific slide just for this structure because it's unique and you should really know how it, how it works and how it is structured. Then we're going to find the cortex. We already discussed that cortex is typically always, actually almost always, the upper part of the uh, organ that we're discussing. For example, the thymus, we're going to find that this specific area is the cortex. So this is exactly as the cortex. This, this part is the cortex. And the more inner part, the more, the more inside part, is the actual medulla of the structure. Now, we're going to find one unique structure in the thymus, and this is the Hassel's corpuscle. This is, again, an aggregation of these unique cells, the thymic epithelial cells, and they're aggregations uh, of many concentrically arranged uh, thymic epithelial cells, and their function is to produce cytokines that serve uh, the procedure of uh, differentiation maturation of the T lymphocytes. So this is actually the first H&E microscopy, microscopy picture you'll see. It's actually very easy to distinguish where the capsule is, where the cortex is, and exactly where the medulla is, simply because we have different densities between the medulla and the capsule. The medulla is, of course, uh, lucid, more lucent, with less dense presence of uh, cells, and in the capsule we find the higher density uh, areas, of course, filled with uh, precursor T cells and these thymic epithelial cells. So, uh, let's talk about the procedure of, of negative and positive selection. Now, this procedure is the, the whole point of the thymus. This is, again, the job of the thymus to select the cells that are able to do two things. First, to bind to an AMHC molecule. This is the positive selection. 
So the, this first stage takes place in the cortex. Now in the cortex, we're going to find again unique thymic epithelial cells which exert, which which uh, sorry, which um, uh, express uh, the structures of AMHC1 and 2. And if a T cell can bind to this AMHC molecule, then this cell will survive and progress to the next stage, which is going to be located in the medulla. If this cell is unable to bind to the MHC molecule, it dies by apoptosis. Now, why is it such an important criterion? Well, because we discussed before that the MHC molecules are the ones that present antigens, uh, self-antigens and antigens, of course. If the T cell is unable to actually bind to this MHC molecule, then it's actually useless because it, if it cannot bind to this, uh, this exact receptor, then there is no uh, purpose, there, is no, there, there won't be a result of the activation of the adaptive system. So the cell is going to be useless, so it dies by apoptosis. Now, let's go to the cells that actually survive and can practically bind the MHC molecule. Then we have the next stage. They could progress to the second phase in the negative selection. Again, this, is, this takes place in the medulla. Uh, so, in the negative selection, this, this survival, this uh, selective procedure is based on the T, lymphoblast, lymphocyte, not being able to recognize and react to an a self antigen. If it recognizes a self antigen and activates itself and in, is in fact uh, induces this whole uh, adaptive response, then of course it's going to die of apoptosis. If not, it can survive and complete the maturation. Now this means what? That if the, if the self antigen, the, if in the case that uh, the self antigen recognition was successful and uh, and in the induces in the end this, uh, this inflammatory response, this would mean that whenever this, if this cell was able to escape and go to the center circulation and go to tissues, to human cells and tissues, it would actually induce the, de destroy the, um, the destruction of such structures and cells. So, of course, this is the procedure by which uh, we achieve central tolerance, because in this way, no cell that can uh, actually destroy its own, uh, its own parts, its own enzymes, its own self, is able to escape from the central location where of the production of the T lymphoblast and T lymphocytes. So it is important to notice that we're going to discuss, of course, the three different types of the four different types of uh, T lymphocytes. We discuss the CD4, the T helper, the CD8, cytotoxic, the CD4 and CD25 positive, uh, the regulatory T cells, and lastly we discuss the gamma, delta, intraepithelial cells. Now all of the T, all of the precursor cells, T cells that go inside the thymus, express most of these uh, CD, this, the CDs, this cluster differentiation. Now there is a very selective loss in the end of this procedure. For example, let's say well, let's take uh, we have a CD4, CD8, and CD25 positive cell. Of course, this is before the maturation, before the uh, complete uh, the completion of the process. So after this completion of the process, if this cell loses only the CD8, CD8 um, uh, receptor, then this cell is going to be CD4 positive and CD25 positive, meaning that this is going to be a T regulatory cell. And the same goes for uh, that CD4 only and the CD8 uh, only, depending on the selective loss of the uh, expression of the CD4 or CD8. So this is the whole procedure of positive and negative selection. Now, um, let's talk about the blood thymus barrier. This is a very unique barrier because it actually is responsible for the pure maintenance of uh, specific molecules inside the thymus. This is of, out of the utmost importance, simply because if we have the, if this, was, this barrier was not present, then we would have different molecules, different proteins, different enzymes, different complete chemical um, environment inside the thymus, of course, that will, of course, inadvertently cause damage and tissue, and tissue damage inside the thymus and or lead to a faulty selection process of the thymus. So let's see how this barrier is so tight and so uh, accurately in controlling its environment. First off, of course, this is the vascular lumen at the top. This is where the blood is located. And as always, we're going to find this capillary, the, the, uh, the typical capillary wall, which is the endothelial cell, the basal lamina. And in this case, occasionally in the blood thymus barrier, we're going to find one or two or maybe none uh, parasites. Uh, this is very important that exactly beneath the parasite, exactly below the parasite, we're going to find a macrophage. And the function of the macrophage in this case is to phagocytose any possible protein or any possible molecule that passes uh, from the blood to this barrier. So this is the last line of phagocytosis of uh, big molecules, let's say. Now, 
exactly beneath the macrophage, you're going to find the basal lamina and these unique thymic epithelial cells. Now, this is the first subtype of these thymic epithelial cells, the ones that, that play a role into the blood thymus barrier and form, of course, their part in the blood thymus barrier. The second one we'll see is this a very, very uh, wonderful, actually, structure called cytoreticulum. We'll see, it's, uh, we'll see where it's located and we'll see what it's made of. And the third is the, uh, the these, these thymic epithelial cells, subtype 3, are the ones that form a barrier from the medulla, from the cortex to the medulla. Uh, so, let's actually visualize this structure just a bit in the microscope shortly before we visualize it into the histology slide. So, first up, we're going to find again typically the uh, capsule as it is in the outer part, dense irregular connective tissue, the cortex, and then the medulla is actually present in uh, fewer sections. Like, for example, here this is the medulla, and this is the medulla again. Again, the difference between the medulla and the cortex is the difference in the density of the cells. What is important and interesting to notice is this, these adipocytes right here. The adipocytes here uh, are one, you know, one of the elements that actually can help us conclude that this is not uh, a, neon, a neonatal or an infant thymus. This is an adult thymus where we have high amount of adipocytes in comparison, to, of course, to the infant one. Now, let's talk a bit about the cytoreticulum. This is the second subcategory of the uh, thymic epithelial cells that we discussed right now. Now, what is the function of the cytoreticulum? The cytoreticulum is, first of all, what it is. It is nothing more than just an aggregation, a very, very, uh, let's say, the, this structure that encircles many lymphocytes inside, the lymphoblasts in this case, uh, many, many lymphoblasts inside, and encases them inside this barrier that the thymic epithelial cells form. And of course, this uh, circular or uh, this, let's say, borders, this bordered structure is connected through desmosomes from the one thymic epithelial cell to the other. Now, what's the purpose of the structure? Well, the thymic epithelial cells are the ones that I told you before, they express the MHC1 and MHC2 complexes. And as a consequence, they play a very, very important role into the negative and positive selection in the thymus. So let's actually uh, visualize lastly, this is the difference before we move on. We should actually visualize the difference between the lymphocytes and the lymphoblasts and the thymic epithelial cells. First of all, the typical characteristic of all lymphocytes, also B, also T, is the uh, high nuclear nucleus to cytoplasm ratio, meaning that we're going to find excessively big nuclei with very, very uh, few and very, very like minor amount of cytoplasm. So in the in the histology slide, slide we're going to easy. It's easy to distinguish that this cell, for example, is not a lymphocyte, and in fact, this is going to be a thymic epithelial cell. And of course, this cell right here with the very, very prominent nucleus is going to be the T lymphocyte, simply because we know that this is the thymus, so it has to be only a T lymphocyte, not a B lymphocyte. Now, this is the structure we discussed before. This is the Hassel's corpuscle, these concentrically arranged thymic epithelial cells that are responsible for the production of cytokines, and of course, they participate in the positive and negative selection. So let's visualize the microscopes, the structures in the microscope. So again, this is the thymus. I'm zooming out to see the whole structure. This is the thymus, and in this section, in this section, we're going to find the neonatal thymus and the uh, adult thymus. And I said before, the difference between these between these two structures is, of course, the size and the presence of the adipocytes. So let's zoom in back and actually find out the specific characteristics and how they look like in the microscope. So at the first point, we're going to find the capsule, which is again dense connective irregular tissue, and this is the cortex where we can find a high amount of uh, lymphoblasts, precursor cells of T lymphocytes, and these are the. This is where the positive selection takes place. And if we zoom in more, we can actually find the molecules. They're going to find the T lymphocytes, the T sorry, the T lymphoblasts, and the indispersed. We can actually see the thymic epithelial cells. For example, this is one right here. The difference, of course, is easy to distinguish because of the high proportion of high, nucleo, high ratio to, from nucleus to cytoplasm. Again, a lot of nucleus, big nuclei with almost no cytoplasm. This is a defining feature of the lymphocytes in general, both B and T. And as we move on, we're going to find again the cortex. Now again, we're going to find the thymic epithelial cells, also pointed out in this case in the arrows. And uh, moving on, we can actually find out, this is of course vessels, these are capillaries that allow blood to come through. And here we can find nice, very nice structures of the Hassel's corpuscle. One is here, second is here. And this is the defining feature of the, um, 
of the thymus. Let's check out some more structures of the thymus, the, the, the hostus corpuscle. There you can see the many different sizes and shapes and irregular shapes of the hostus corpuscle. This is another for example. This is much more typical with a concentrical arrangement of the thymic epithelial cell. Let's focus a bit on the spleen. So the spleen actually, we should visualize the spleen as a structure that performs two different functions. We have the immunological function of the spleen and of course the blood filtering function. It's also important to notice that the spleen is not the only organ that filters uh, the blood. Of course, it's the major one, the most one of the most, the, the number one structure that filters the blood. But also we have the red, the red blood marrow, the red bone marrow, and of course the liver that eventually is able to filter out uh, these blood cells, the red blood cells. This is why in the cases of, uh, of patients that undergo splenectomy, the removal of the spleen, of course, this, the, there are of course some consequences when it comes to the filtering of blood, but still this is a vital condition you still can survive because there is the, uh, this com this com uh, the difference, the compensation of the filtering of the blood through these two different structures I just mentioned. So let's focus a bit on this thing. We're going to find the two different functions and these two different functions are, uh, are actually covered through two different structures inside the spleen. First off, let's actually visualize just a bit the general structure and let's further on move on to the specifics. So in the outer part, we're going to find the capsule. Again, the capsule is always dense, irregular connective tissue. And inside the spleen, we're going to find these two different structures, the pulps, the red pulp and the white pulp. Now, the white pulp is the area that is responsible for the, of course, the immunological reaction of the spleen. Of course, we have a high amount of lymphocytes present in the spleen. And this, of course, helps with specific hematogenous, uh, hematogenous spread of specific bacteria, specific, of course, factors. So let's visualize what is this white pulp made of. Now, the white pulp, of course, as we can see, as we can see is a structure that, is, that covers up uh, the central arteriole. This is, of course, the, all of the blood that comes through the trabecular artery eventually is being spread out into numerous central arterioles. And surrounding these central arterioles, you're going to find the first structure, the white pulp. Now, this white pulp contains a high amount of B cells, as I just said right now. And this is, of course, the location where we're going to find, again, lymph nodules, again, primary and secondary, activated and unactivated uh, nodules. If the structure is going to be exactly the same of the, with the lymph node in the specific nodules, exactly the same features are going to be found. The difference is that, of course, we're going to find this unique structure, the periarticular lymphoid sheath, or PALS. This is a specific sheath that covers up the whole length of the central arterial, or like a big, very big part, a portion of the central arterial, and of course, they work together in conjunction with the B cells in order to uh, specifically initiate and uh, carry on as this, the proper adaptive response uh, immune reaction against the specific antigen. So this is again the same structure. We're going to visualize the marks in just a bit. <coughs> Let's talk a bit about the red pulp. We said that this is the filtering, this is the uh, area, the region in which the filtering of the blood takes place. Now how does this happen? Well, the red pulp is exactly all of this area is of course all the other the other the other points of the of the white pulp and everything except the white pulp is the structure of the red pulp we're going to find these two different types of circulations in these cases the open circulation and the closed circulation what does this mean well the open circulation is simply one ended single ended open completely open capillaries that allow of course the um, the flow of erythrocytes throughout the whole red pulp and throughout the uh, let's say the contents of the spleen, inside the spleen, outside the circulation. And the closed circulation, is this is of course, this is where the whole magic happens, of course. This is where the whole filtering procedure takes place. And actually the mechanism by which it happens is brilliant, in fact. So what, what, constitutes, what constitutes the need for the human body to filter out the red blood cells? We know that the red blood cells have approximately a lifetime of 100 and 120 days. This is pretty much the average lifespan of an of a red blood cell. But what, why is it so? Well, because the red blood cells need to be flexible, 100% flexible. And this is because the size and the, and the uh, functions that the red blood cells produces is, require, of course, this high flexibility. This is a vacuum cave shape. We already mentioned before that specifically the red blood cells have approximately a diameter of 7 micrometers and the capillaries can range from 4 to 6. So if the red blood cells are not flexible and they lose the flexibility through mechanical uh, through mechanical trauma or through simply uh, wearing out, of course, a structure, this cell will be unable to pass through the capillary and cause, of course, an obstruction. Now, the, the spleen is responsible for filtering all these old red blood cells. How? First of all, we have all, the, all of these 
uh, of the red blood cells that come out of the open circulation and are actually uh, feel they're present in the interstitial space uh, inside the spleen, they have to, of course, re-enter through the closed uh, circulation. Now, what is this closed circulation? This is simply nothing more than continuation of the arteriole and the formation of these unique sinusoids that we're going to find in the uh, structure of the closed circulation. The closed circulation exactly happens through this, the per passage of blood through the serial arterial, continuation through the sinusoid, and of course, then it's going to be the vein, uh, the venule, of course, that is going to be exactly after the capillary. So, what is unique about the sinusoid? First, we're going to first off, we're going to find different structures. Of course, we're going to have the endothelial lining, but the endothelial lining here is a bit different than the uh, the typical endothelial lining. Of course, the sinusoid. This is a big uh, sinusoid, of course, or discontinuous capillary, which means that there are big spaces in between the endothelial lining and the basement membrane. So we're going to have three structures that filter out and allow only the ones, only the red blood cells that are flexible enough mechanically to go back to this closed circulation. Any red blood cell that is unable to pass from the interstitial space of, this, of the spleen in, to the sinusoid, of course, is going to stay in the location, is in the interstitial space of the, uh, of, the red, of the red pulp, and eventually is going to be phagocytosed by macrophages. So, what are these, what are these, these three structures that actually boot the barrier, are actually the structures that filter out these cells? Well, the first one is the stave cell. The stave cell is nothing more than just a specific name we use for these unique endothelial lining cells of the sinusoid. So the stave cells are the endothelial cells of this sinusoid. The second structure is going to be, of course, the basin membrane, which is going to be discontinuous. Of course, there are going to be major gaps in between them. And the third one is going to be reticular fibers. The reticular fibers, you can see by the picture, they encircle the whole structure of the closed circulation and prevent and let's say prevent the, uh, the uh, not flexible enough cells to go from the, the spleen, from the splenic parenchyma inside back to the circulation. Now, the ones that are unable to pass will be phagocytosed eventually and through the whole procedure you should discuss in physiology, you're going to see the return of iron from the macrophages back to the systemic circulation through specific transferrins, ferritins and other proteins that play a role into this uh, procedure. So, let's actually see and visualize how this uh, spleen, how the spleen looks like in this cases. So first we're going to find again the capsule, something more again, this is dense irregular connective tissue, the trabecula, this is the projection of this irregular tissue throughout the whole structure of the uh, spleen. We're going to find the white pulp, and the white pulp is easy to distinguish simply because we're going to find again T and B lymphocytes. And again, the morphology of the T and B lymphocytes is very, very uh, characteristic and thus makes the structure easily identifiable in the microscope. Again, high nuclear to cytoplasm ratio. And we're going to find the red pulp, all the rest of the area that is not typically characterized by the presence of the lymphocytes is going to be easy to distinguish and this is going to be called the red pulp. So let's actually visualize a bit the white pulp in this, uh, in this section then we're going to go into the microscope to visualize them all together. So the central arteriole is of course again easy to distinguish because we're going to find the typical characteristic of the arteriole. Again, this is the endothelial lining, the lumen, the lumen, the endothelial lining and the basement membrane along with the pericytes and specifically with the uh, very, very short tunicas, and very small tunicas in this case of the arteries. Exactly surrounding it, we saw the line that covers up the PALS, the, the sheath, is this, the continuous lining against that surrounds, immediately surrounds the structures of the central arteriole. So this is going to be the PLS, of course, exactly outside. It's not easy, again, it's not possible to identify the T lymphocyte and B from B lymphocyte in the microscope. So we only can understand where the PLS is located through the uh, just, but just business location. And we can know that these are the T lymphocytes just because we know the location of where they are, but not because of the specific characteristic in the microscope. And so around again, we're going to find the rest of the white pulp, which is going to be, again, a T lymphocyte area. The, this is, again... The structure we're going to see in this place. So even at, the, at this level, this, this level of magnification, we can actually easily identify the areas of the capsule and specifically the areas of the white pulp and the areas of the red pulp right here, based simply on the high basophilic colors of the white pulp, because again, this is where we're going to find the lymphocytes. So let's zoom in and figure out exactly the structures and where they are. So first up, we're going to have the capsule that's around exactly this area. This is again the dense regular connective tissue. And exactly beneath, we're going to find the, this again, this is the area of the red pulp. And if we zoom in, we're going to actually visualize the structures that are the specific, the sinusoids. And this actually, we're going to find 
also the presence of the splenic cords. Now these are of course nothing more than aggregations of loose connective tissue that contains macrophages, plasma cells, lymphocytes, and of course they are the uh, they surround of course the splenic sinusoids. Now the splenic sinusoids of course are actually visible easily because this is the area where we can actually visualize the empty spaces and then the, uh, this uh, let's say dense area, this lucid area exactly in the center. This is where of course the sections of the uh, the capillaries are exactly the presence of the sinusoids are. So if we zoom out we can actually visualize and understand that, for example okay, this is a perfect section of the central arterial. So exactly so we're going to find the white, the, P the PALS, this, this T cell presence, the, the, this is the T cell dependent zone, and this is the primary nodule as we can actually visualize it right here. Let's actually visualize a secondary nodule, an activated, an activated nodule. And this is one. This is, this is the germinal center, exactly beneath this is the, uh, the mantle zone, that is, this is the typical activated uh, lymph nodule where we can actually visualize both the germinal center and the mantle zone in both cases. So let's do a quick also overview of the tonsils. So the tonsils again, this is a part of the malt, this is part of the nucleus associated lymphoid tissue and in this actual tonsils we're actually going to find a specific structure called the Waldiris ring. This is of course where we're going to find the many different tonsils and the, and the, orophar the oropharynx and generally the pharyngeal structures so we're going to find first off the adenoid, this is again the top in the nasopharynx on the top. Then we're going to find once more structures, the, the tubal tonsil at the bottom uh, of the, the, again, the posterior area of the nasopharynx again. Now we're going to find also beneath exactly that the palatine tonsil and the ligon tonsil is going to be in the base of the posterior or the posterior area of the tongue. The point of this, look, the point of these structures is again, uh, again, epithelially covered structures with primary and secondary leaf nodules. So let's actually to look at the general structure, again, also we're going to have the epithelial lining of the uh, tonsil in this case, and we're going to find tonsillar crypts. What is, the what is the purpose of the crypts? First of all, the crypt is nothing more than just a deep invagination of the, of the deep imagination of the epithelium. And this is because by achieving this, by doing this procedure, we increase the surface area and we increase also uh, the, the active area where we can actually uh, grab onto different antigens and different type of patho pathogens inside the oral cavity or the nasal cavity and initiate a response and initiate an adaptive response inside these primary nodules if and if they're activated of course the secondary nodules. So again this is the structure as we've discussed. You can visualize the nice epithelial lining with the deep crypt and the presence of the uh, lymph, the primary and secondary lymph nodules. For example this is the germinal center so this is identified, this is a typical presence of the uh, secondary activated nodule. Now, uh, histologically speaking, there are a few differences between the palatine tonsil. We're going to talk about a bit just about the palatine and the lingual just as a sample, uh, because actually they're very, very similar uh, among the, with all the rest of the features. So the palatine tonsil can actually have more than one crypt, can have specifically 10 to 20 crypts. And this is again the morphology, typical again the epithelial covering along with the uh, lymphoid nodules inside the, uh, inside the, exactly beneath the mucosa. And of course, we're going to find also sometimes that this is a partially encapsulated structures. And the lingual tonsil, we're going to find the one unique tonsillar crypt and of course again the same structures, uh, the same uh, nodules and also sometimes at the, no, sometimes at the, also at the bottom of the structure, the posterior end, the posterior area of the structure, we're going to find these mucosecreting glands. So again this is the uh, another picture we can actually visualize the palatine tonsil and at the tongue, at the back of the tongue, at the base of the tongue, we're going to find again at the most posterior, in the most posterior part of the tongue, we're going to find the lingual tonsil. So this is exactly the location of the lingual tonsil at the posterior bottom of the tongue and the inferior border along with the uh, inferior and posterior border of the tongue with a single tonsillar crypt in presence of the lingual glands. Thank you very much.